Good morning, St. Luke's. We are sheltering in place. We're sheltering in God. And today we find Jesus angry. Yeah, angry as in turning over tables, kind of angry, having a raised voice, making a big commotion in the temple courts, chasing out the money changers, driving out the animals that were there for sale. I mean, really making a big fuss. Well, getting angry is familiar to most of us, right? Even those of us who don't get angry often know how anger can sneak up on us and then suddenly we find ourselves agitated and all that energy arises and watch out world. Well, it may not surprise you to learn that Jesus' anger isn't quite like ours. In fact, when Jesus gets angry, it's really not about him at all. It's an anger that moves him into action on behalf of someone else. Today, lessons on anger. Call it irritation, call it resentment. We're all familiar with the energy of anger. The Gospel reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Good morning, children of St. Luke's. I think it would be awful to go to church on Sunday mornings with people trying to sell us stuff as we walked into church. The people in our story today who were outside the temple selling things were really tricking people into thinking that they could buy the goods and then offer them as a sacrifice to God once they got into the temple. They dishonored the temple, and Jesus wasn't happy about it. This is one of the only times in his life when Jesus lost his temper, because it meant so much to him to keep this a holy place. They were using the temple as a place to make money. Our church is a special place. We come to church to worship God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for keeping our family and our friends safe and healthy. Thank you for our beautiful place of worship. Please help us to remember to take good care of it and to always honor you when we are there. In Jesus' name, amen. Today in our text, we find Jesus angry. So we're gonna be speaking about anger this morning. And uh, he's angry enough to turn tables over to make a whip out of cords and to chase everyone out the court of the Gentiles. So it's a very kind of expressive anger, uh, not the quiet kind of anger that no one can see. This is a, this is a loud display of anger, uh, which of course for us raises all sorts of questions, right? Jesus getting angry. Isn't it wrong to be angry? Isn't it wrong to show that you're angry? Apparently not. Apparently not. Um, Remember, Jesus shows us what it looks like to be human and to fully trust God. So, (laughs) trusting God or being a faithful person or being connected with God doesn't look like never ever being angry. Um, So it's not anger that's the problem uh, for most people. It's what we do with the anger energy 
that can become a problem. Because anger is just energy, right? It's just an, another emotion. It can be very helpful. It can be used to inform us and help us, or it can be um, quite destructive. So we're going to be looking at this this morning, this whole idea of anger. And um, let me just read a little bit of the text here. Here's the angry part. He goes into the temple courts and he sees people selling and buying in the prayer section of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Making a whip out of cords, he drove them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers. He overturned the tables. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. So that's the passage we're looking at. Actually, I should mention he did not steal any money and he didn't destroy any property. Just saying, might be helpful to note that. Actually, I don't want to get off on a whole other subject, but Jesus was nonviolent. He just wasn't passive. He was nonviolent if you watch his actions, but he certainly wasn't passive. So, back to the text here. We ex well, we've come to learn that Jesus was loving and kind and full of compassion. And we hear a lot of text stories, narratives, uh, describing Jesus as kind and loving and gentle and compassionate. And of course, we're called to follow in Jesus' footsteps, follow in his ways, uh, live the way he lived in the world. That's what he means when he says, come follow me. There's another side of Jesus that isn't emphasized quite as much, and it's this side of him is equally as important. It's his, really his passion for the forgotten ones, the people that don't have a voice, um, the ignored people. So, we do see Jesus acting in very loving and kind and gentle ways. But there's also this other side that when he sees uh, people being stepped on, when he sees people being ignored, when he sees people not being loved well, that moves him into action. And this is, I think, what we're seeing a little bit in this text. It's, it's similar to us in a way. Um, when you love someone, you will go to great lengths to relieve their suffering if it's within your power, right? Um, if you are a good parent, now I know not all parents have done this or do this, but if you're a good healthy parent, um, you're not going to let anything happen to your precious child. It's just not going to happen. Good parents are going to stand in the gap and they're going to make sure that no harm comes to that child. Now, Jesus said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father? Meaning, if you, who are limited, know how to love and protect your children, how much more does God care about these things? Which means that any time, I mean, Jesus is reflective of the Father's heart, any time God sees one of his children being ignored or forgotten or oppressed or hurt, that's a big, big problem, if we can even use that language when talking about God. Jesus said, it'd be better if a millstone were tied around your neck, you're thrown into the deepest sea than you to touch and hurt one of these children of God's, God's children. It's a big deal. So when Jesus goes into the temple courts this particular day and he sees people selling animals for sacrifice and for making profit in the place of prayer, and there are money changers there exchanging money because people are coming in from Jerusalem all over the place and they have to have a place to exchange their money for the local currency. So there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of money making going on. There's a lot of profit racketeering. And this is all taking place in the court 
the prayer court of the Gentiles. Now, what you might not know is, is that in those days, the, the, the ancient Jewish people had a had temple for worship and, and sacrifice, but they also had what they called God fearers, non-Jewish people who also believed in Israel's God and were attracted to Israel's one God, one creator God. And so a court, an outer court was designated for these Gentile prayers. All this is happening in their particular prayer place. And when Jesus sees this injustice, this all this commerce and noise and buying and selling, and he, he immediately actively gets involved to right a wrong or to take a stance to let people see this is not right, this is wrong. And by his action, going in there and flinging the tables over and chasing the people out, it's like he's saying, and it's kind of a symbolic action in some ways because it would, it carried on after this. It's not like it just stopped this particular day, but at least in this one instance, he's going in and he's saying, look at this, this is, this is wrong. This isn't right. There's something wrong here. You're using this prayer place to make money. I mean, how corrupt can you get? And he, and he chases them out. Now, no doubt they'll be back again in a couple of hours or the next again day and it carried on because all this temple sacrifice didn't stop until 70 years after the crucifixion. But he's showing his disciples and those around him of what is really important to him. And then there's that line that you'll see in the text, zeal for your father's house will consume me. We'll talk about that later. But it's showing, showing us what's really, really important to him, what is really moving to him. And all this anger and this energy wells up and he feels compelled to do something about it. Now, anger, very, very, very powerful emotion which in some ways can be most destructive and in other ways it can be a very helpful sort of energy. In the New Testament, anger really isn't understood as right or wrong. It's sort of a neutral thing, as modern psychology will also teach us today, that the emotion of anger is neither right nor wrong. It's a neutral sort of thing. It's actually a type of intelligence that can inform us it can tell us if we're in danger, it can tell us if we're being hurt, it can tell us all sorts of things. The anger in the New Testament isn't portrayed as uh, right or wrong, like for example in Ephesians 4.26, Paul says, St. Paul, be angry but don't sin. Another way of saying it, you can be angry but don't let it lead you to out of control actions that hurt you and others and that you will regret. That's a wrong use of that energy. That energy has taken over you. You're no longer controlling that energy. So St. Paul's saying anger can either be helpful to us, inform us, tell us something's wrong, sort of a radar, an alarm, or it can hinder us and it can damage us and it can certainly damage other people around us. So the scripture says, not all anger is negative, that's for sure. Be angry, be angry and sin not. If it's leading you in the wrong direction, yeah, sure, it can be really bad. But it doesn't always do that. Anger is there for a reason right? It's a signal of sorts. You're feeling anger in a relationship tells you something's wrong here, something's off. can alert you to something that's wrong that can be very helpful. Or you could be angry that I'm hurt or this isn't fair. Or you could be looking at someone else and saying that person's getting hurt. That's not fair on what's ever happening to that particular person. Or you could be betrayed and feel angry 
or something immoral could happen, you could feel anger. So it's really all about information, anger, initially. But then there's this other kind of anger that we'll also be familiar with, and it's a type of anger that really doesn't serve any good purpose. For the most part, it's kind of brooding anger. It's that sort of simmering resentment when my personal feelings have been hurt in some way or somebody's annoyed me in some way. I'm, I'm harboring resentment. Not particularly helpful to me or to anyone else. Or it's the kind of anger that's nitpicky and it's fault finding. It's the kind of anger that's always seeing what's wrong in a person, a situation, a problem. So it's that, would, that would be the kind of anger that's exasperating to me and it's also exasperating to those around us, right? There's the type of anger that uh, becomes internalized and the person doesn't even know they're angry until it explodes one day. And it's like, whoa, what? I had no idea Harry was that angry. What's going on here? Well, maybe Harry had no idea that he was angry either because he's so out of touch with his anger. So there's so many different states of anger and some of it's healthy and some of it isn't healthy. And it takes a fair amount of discernment to start to process um, what anger is saying and where we are, what kind of anger we have. Uh, is it helpful? Is it not helpful? Is it leading us in the right direction or is it leading us away from the right direction toward harm? Jesus also had a teaching, not to confuse you, but Jesus also had a teaching against, against this kind of anger that I'm talking about. So he would also say things like, this is unhelpful anger he's talking teaching about. He would say things like, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I say to you, don't even be angry with your brother or sister. Now again, he's referring to destructive anger that can take over your life and destroy relationships. It's usually the end result. Destructive anger harms us. It harms relationships, it harms families, congregations, uh, communities. It's a really powerful energy. So Jesus spoke about, about this sort of destructive force of anger also, because this is the kind of anger that leads to hate. And this is the kind of anger that leads to having an enemy. And this is the kind of anger that leads to <laughs> If you, have an, if you need an enemy, then that leads to war, right? And then the cycle continues down throughout the millennium. You know, people have all this anger. They don't know what to do with it. They scapegoat someone, a nation, a people, whatever. The problem's always out here. The war happens, you know, and then it goes on and on and on. So anger's a huge topic from just individual slights to wars. So it's somewhat complex. But um, in this particular case, the big difference between Jesus' anger, which I'll call righteous anger, rightness, the big difference between Jesus' righteous anger and the anger that s s some of us experience, I won't say all of us, but the anger that would be familiar to many of us, certainly to me, um, I'm more likely to get angry over personal offences and frustrations and slights. I'm more likely to be angry about um, an annoying personality or um, somebody um, getting in the way of me completing my tasks that I need to get done for the day. You know, I can get riled up over all minor offences. So my anger tends to be more about me. It's about my ego and what's affecting me. Jesus' anger is quite different. It's not ego-centered at all. His anger is all about, I'm concerned about this group, this person, 
something unfair is happening here and I want to go in and stop this. Uh, the core of the Gentile, the, these people are trying to pray. Nobody cares. Who cares about the court of the Gentiles? They're Jewish men. They don't care about Gentiles. They don't care about Gentiles. Jesus cared. It's like there's people over there, they're trying to connect with God. They're, they're trying to get their lives together and connect with God. They're not going to be able to do this in this marketplace. So his anger isn't about him. It's not about him being personally offended or being bugged or whatever. It's like, this is wrong. This is wrong. So his anger is, he's angry at those who obstruct compassion and care. So that's quite different, isn't it? You know, because like I said, for me, much of my anger isn't about, you know, the obstruction of compassion. It would be about somebody driving on the road crazy or something, right? Um, like for Jesus, it's usually, oh, well, actually always, for Jesus, you see him becoming angry when people around him are getting hurt. For example, there's another, there's another situation where the religious leaders don't want him to heal on the Sabbath because it's against the law. I mean, he's, he's like, my paraphrase, are you crazy? You don't want me to heal someone because it's the Sabbath and I should rest? And this person's suffering? Are you completely out of touch with God? Well, yes, they were. They were. So for Jesus, anger always moves him to this corrective action. He wants to do something about it. Or he wants to make a point. I think in this case, in this text, he's making a point to his disciples. This is wrong. You need to stand up when you see something is wrong, students. When you see these things happening, you need to stand up and you need to do something about it. I mean, I'm sure there were many people that thought that the selling and the buying in the, in the prayer place was wrong, but they wouldn't necessarily do something about it. He's doing something, he's showing, he's modeling to students, he's modeling to us. Sometimes it's necessary to actually take action and do something, not just think about it, but to actually do something about it. And like I said, often our anger isn't really about important things like, I don't know, there's so many important things in the world. People who don't have countries or homes or people who are, don't have enough to eat and, you know, persecuted Christians worldwide. I mean, there's so many there's so much suffering in the world. Often it doesn't really get a lot of our attention because we're, we're focused on other things. And often our anger really isn't on that scale. It's, it's not really employed to change the world. Our anger energy isn't really employed to change the world for the most part. For the most part, it's not necessarily used to relieve the suffering of others. You know, it's maybe more in the lines of you left the kitchen in a mess or somebody, like I said, somebody cuts me off in traffic or it's usually personal offenses, which as far as Jesus is concerned, when it comes down to personal offenses, that's not really a good way. That's really a not, not a, a good use of energy to be spending a lot of time on who or what is offending you personally. Um, we can get bogged down, in other words, by the wrong things, it seems. We can spend a lot of energy in the wrong things. Thinking about the wrong things, pondering over the wrong things, worrying, worrying about the wrong things, repeating the same wrong things to ourselves. Jesus would caution, well, St. Paul clearly cautions, watch what you're thinking about. You know, we can get so immersed in everyday living that, you know, we can really forget. We can forget to, to live out our calling, you know, which is, you know, you're the light of the world, people. That's the calling. Remember when somebody's baptized, we give them a candle? 
when they're baptized? Yeah, why? Well, it's symbolic. It's like you're a follower of Christ. You're light and you're, you're going to change the world. You're going to turn this world upside down because you're light and there's a lot of darkness in this world and you're going to make a difference. I think we can forget that at times. Just getting bogged down with daily life. But, you know, anger, which is really a little bit moral outrage, changes the world. It really changes the world. It relieves people's suffering. You know, why did 12 year olds no longer work 12 hours a day? Somebody looked at these kids and said, that's wrong. You know, why do, why do, why do people of different races, why are they allowed to be married? Because somebody said that that's wrong. Why are people, why are same sex people allowed to marry? Because somebody looked at that and said, you know what, that's not fair. That's, that's not just, that's not, that's not right. Why do women get to vote? Because somebody said, that's not fair. That's not right. And even the church, the church is so slow. I mean, women have only been ordained 50 years. <laughs> 50 years, that's not a long time. Somebody 50 years ago and before that said, you know, that's not right. That's got to change. It's compassion. It's fairness that moves people to do all these sorts of things. You know, if nobody cared, nothing would ever change. So, you know, even religious systems like our own need constant reformation. And of course, in Jesus' day, you know, it's slightly, I mean, it's different because obviously they're buying animals to sacrifice and they're using this court to do all their business you know, and selling and everything. Well, that's not our issue today. But what he is doing is he's showing us, you know, step up and, and, and get involved in some way if you see something's wrong. Now, again, in the his historical context, it didn't stop, stop that day. The sacrificing of animals didn't stop that day. The selling of animals didn't stop that day. That didn't stop until 70 AD. 70 CE. Christian era is another way of talking about it. But Jesus' righteous anger and deep grief and concern and care drove him to do something about it. Yeah, I think it takes, I think it takes a, a, a mature, developed faith to, to look beyond yourself and to look beyond your immediate loved ones, your little nuclear family, you know, it takes a mature faith to look beyond that to the outer sufferings of the world and actually use some energy for that to change the world. I mean, it's, it's almost like the passage is instructing us, if you're gonna get hot and bothered about something, make sure there's something worthwhile. You know, if you're going to get angry and all upset and well, make sure that you're using that energy, that anger energy for good purposes. Uh, that it's not all about you. And you're what you're offended at personally, because that's not necessarily helpful at all. There's this line in this text, it's an interesting one, when Jesus is you know, telling everyone to get out and throw the tables in the air and chase the animals out of space. It says, zeal for your house will consume me. So the disciples are looking at him and they remember this line from the Psalms that describes Jesus, the Messiah. That zeal for your house will consume me. Well, that doesn't mean much to us, but if you're zealous for something, you're really passionate about something, right? So it's saying, zeal for your house, that would be house as in the temple, as in the place where the presence of God. Jesus is zealous about people connecting with the presence of God. That's what he's all about, really. You know, I've come that you might have life. I'm, I've come that you might connect with the presence of God. Walk with me and I'll show you how to walk in the presence of God. So his whole life, his teaching, 
his time, his energy, his joy, was all connected with zeal for your house will consume me. And so it's like, how can I explain this for us today? If you're zealous for God, you're passionate about the right things. If you're zealous for God, you care about the things that are truly important. You care about the things that God cares about. You, you, you release the things that aren't as important. So, and it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can be 23, you can be 95. You've, we've all got some energy, we've all got time, we've all got, we're still alive and we're on this earth and we're breathing, right? We're all, we're all in different places. We're all in different ages. We're all in different stages. But if we are walking with Christ, we're using, to the best of our ability at this time, we're using the life that we have to be zealous for the right things. I think what this passage teaches us is, if you're going to be zealous for something, if you're going to be energetic about something, if you, if you want to use your life force well, then make sure you're investing in the right things. You know, you can invest in the wrong things. We can spend a lot of time putting a lot of energy into a particular person or a particular problem or a particular project or a particular job. And it's like, this isn't very life-giving. I don't know what's wrong with my life, but I'm, this isn't very life-giving. Well, no, maybe it's not. Because maybe God is leading us in another direction. Because I think that when we truly connect with God or God's presence, there's a bit of life about that. You know, you feel like you're in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. It all sorts of, it comes together doesn't necessarily mean it's easy, or life is easy, doesn't mean to say we don't have any problems, doesn't mean to say we don't have our down days, but basically overall, we have a sense, no, this is my task, this is why I'm here, this is what I need to do now. There's that sort of sense of, yeah, this is, this is what I need, this is where I need to be, and this is what I need to do. That's a life-giving thing when you can, when you can say that. And I think this, this is what Jesus is modeling here. He knows why, he, he knows what's right, he knows what's wrong, he knows what's his to do and what isn't. He knows when to step in, he knows when not to step in. He didn't do the same thing again next week, didn't do the same thing again next month, right? Timing is important, but he knows when to step up and say something and do something. Yeah, there's a lot in the text, isn't there? It's a, it's, it's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a many, many ways that the Spirit could speak to you through a text like this. So I, I'm even hesitant to focus it too much in one way or another. I think the simplest thing for me to do is, uh, is to encourage you to, to watch how you use your time and energy and particularly you know because anger is a sort of an energy I mean it fuels you and it keeps you going um, to just think about that to just think about where you're placing your time your energy if it is indeed in the right things if it's indeed going in the right direction or is it too me centered or is it just centered in the wrong place? Just something to sit with and think about, reflect upon, and allow the Spirit to show you. You know, just think about that line, zeal for your house will consume me. And then think, well, what, what consumes me? What consumes me? And is it helpful? Is it good? So life giving. There's the heart cry. There's the prayer. Show me, show me God. Show me what to put my time, 
my thoughts, my energy into. But I might not have a wasted life. Amen. Again, I like to each week just take a moment to acknowledge uh, your faithfulness in your giving to the ministry here. It's certainly not something that I take for granted. A year ago, I was really concerned. I remember when we first went into our sheltered in place, I thought, how in the world are we going to keep going when we can't meet? And here we are, you know, almost a year later. And uh, we're doing well we're doing well and certainly hope that in the next few months that we will be able to be back in person again and this will be a memory but i do want to thank every one of you for sending in your offerings and putting your offering through our mailbox uh, it's it's all received with gratitude thank you for your faithfulness <laughs> 